Hello, this is Dr. Golding, and uh, today I'm going to present a theory in defense of objective morality. There are many people who believe that morality is subjective, that moral judgments are subjective, they are judgments that are based on feeling or desire or preference. Other people, such as myself, believe in objective morality. The idea of objective morality is that it is an objective moral fact that certain things are right to do or wrong to do, or that certain character traits are either right or wrong to have. So for example, I believe that, take the following example of a moral judgment, it is worse to kill a human than a cockroach. In general, as a general statement, there may be exceptions to that. There may be cases where one needs to kill a human being for a certain specific reason. But let's say, for example, we'll fix it up a little bit. We'll say uh, it is worse to kill a human being just for fun than a cockroach just for fun. So according to someone like me who's a uh, objectivist about morality, we believe that that is actually a fact. It is actually worse to kill a human just for fun rather than a cockroach just for fun. In fact, there might be something wrong with killing cockroaches just for fun as well. But that's just an example of a moral judgment which the objectivist believed is, is an objective fact. It's not something that it's merely an expression of preference or desire, or something like, well, I happen to like humans more than cockroaches, which, by the way, is true about myself as well. I do happen to like human beings more than cockroaches, but that's, that's, that's an expression of my personal preferences and desires. Um, so I believe that the statement, it is worse to kill a human just for fun rather than a cockroach just for fun, is an objective moral fact. So what I'm going to try to do today in this lecture is actually defend, give a defense and a, a, a theory which would support the notion that that is an objective fact rather than merely an expression of opinion. And along the way, I will also um, talk about some other issues having to do with, for example, well, especially toward the end of this lecture, uh, what is the proper motivation for why a human being should behave morally? What's the relationship between morality and happiness, morality and pleasure? Also, I'd love to talk a little bit about the relationship between morality and religion. Um, and specifically, what I'd like to emphasize here today that is in the theory that I'm going to give and try to defend, uh, we're gonna call it a theory of being, and I'll explain why I call it a theory of being shortly. Um, but, um, what I'd like to say first is that this theory that I'm propounding does not depend, nor does it require, a belief in God's existence. I happen to believe in God, and I think it's a very important belief that I have, and I think it's a, a very important fact about the universe that God does exist. But this theory that I'm offering does not depend, nor does it require, that God exists, at least not as God is traditionally conceived by the major Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and of course there are other religions as well. But this theory does not require, nor does it depend on the belief in God. However, I am going to illustrate that based on the theory that I present, there's going to be some important consequences regarding the theory if it turns out that God does exist. So, we are going to talk a little bit about God in this lecture, but that's not really the main topic. My main focus, my main goal in this lecture is to try to argue in favor of an objective theory of morality. And so we'll get started. Now we're going to call it a theory of being, and I'll explain that in a minute. But um, the basic uh, insight that um, this theory operates with is um, starting from the notion of what's called intrinsic worth. We're going to talk about the idea of intrinsic worth. Many philosophers think that the idea of intrinsic worth doesn't really make sense. 
What does make sense, according to many philosophers, and according to, let's say, a subjectivist about mor morality, is the idea of extrinsic worth. So actually what I'm going to do is, I'm going to first talk about the idea of extrinsic worth, because that's an idea that's very easy to grasp, and a lot of philosophers and normal people agree with it and believe in it. Um, the idea of intrinsic worth is more problematic. Now, the idea of intrinsic worth, of course the word worth means value in some sense. What would make something extrinsically valuable? The word extrinsic means there's something outside of that thing that makes it valuable. So for example, we would all agree that, um, let's say, uh, at least for most of us, we would agree that a chair is a valuable thing to have. Now, what kind of value does a chair have, or let's say a knife, or a fork, or a plate? The kinds of, the kind of value that these things have, instruments, are that because we have a certain desire, okay, there's something that we want. We want to eat. We want to sit down. So therefore, for us, it turns out that a chair is a valuable thing. Um, I want to eat dinner. I need to have a fork in order to eat. So therefore, a fork becomes a valuable thing to have. Now, that's, that's extrinsic worth. The value that uh, vessels, instruments, tools, a shovel, even money. Money is valuable. We all want to have money. Why is money valuable to us? Because we can use the money to acquire other things that we want. So, in other words, money has extrinsic worth. A chair has extrinsic worth. The chair is, in and of itself, not really of value, it's only valuable because there's something else, something outside of the chair, namely the fact that I happen to have a desire to sit down, which then makes the chair valuable to me. Okay, and uh, by the way, uh, Thomas Hobbes, for example, is an example of a uh, philosopher who would say that um, all worth or goodness is extrinsic or subjective. There's nothing intrinsically worthy. There's nothing that has value in and of itself. That's the mysterious idea. Now Kant, the philosopher Kant, does believe in intrinsic worth. And in certain ways, this theory that I'm offering is going to utilize some insights of Kant, but also differ a little bit with Kant. But we know that ex ex extrinsic worth is something that is subjective. In other words, let's suppose I... Um, you know, for me, let's suppose I have a backyard and I want to plant some shrubs. So for me, a shovel is a valuable thing to have. That's extrinsic worth. But if you don't have a backyard or you don't want to make a garden in your backyard, then for you, a shovel is not going to be extrinsically worthy, right? So extrinsic worth is subjective. It's dependent. It's contingent, as philosophers would say, on someone having a certain desire that they have, and because they have that desire, therefore they want to have a shovel, therefore for them the shovel is valuable. So when it comes to this extrinsic worth, extrinsic worth is subjective, it changes from time to time, even the person himself or herself, if they, you know, stop having a garden, then for them the shovel becomes not so extrinsically worthy after all. Um, the idea of intrinsic worth then, would be the idea that there can be something which in and of itself has value or worth, not because of something outside of it. So, is there such a thing as extrins intrinsic worth? Can we make sense of that notion? And what I'm going to argue is that the idea of the intrinsic worth does make sense if we think of the question, what would make one thing valuable insofar as it is the very being that it is? What would make something have some kind of worth insofar as it is the being that it is? Can there be certain features, and I'm going to argue that there are certain features, certain properties, that would make one being be better in its very being than another being. So in other words, we're going to have to engage in what we might call 
an ontological exercise. Let's leave that up there. Um, the word ontology. We're going to have to get a little bit into what's called ontology in philosophy. Ontology means the study of being. It comes from the Greek word ontos and logos. Logos means the study of thinking about. Ontos means being. So ontology is the study of being. Now, we're going to do a little ontological exercise here. We're going to think about what qualities would make one being be better as a being in and of itself, just insofar as it is a being, what qualities would make one being somehow be a better being than another being? So uh, we're going to have to think about what I'm going to call ontological qualities, okay? Um, ontological qualities, we'll come back to the idea of intrinsic worth shortly. Let's erase this just to make some room. We're going to have to think about some ontological qualities, meaning properties that have to do with the very being of a thing. Now, there's a lot of properties that a thing can have which I would not call ontological properties. For example, the color of a given thing. Okay, whether something is red or green or blue or white or black or pink or yellow, whether something has a given color or lacks that color doesn't really affect the status of that thing's being. But I'll give you an example of one quality, and I'm going to have a list of qualities here, which are ontological qualities that have to do with the nature of the being of a thing. Okay, so for example, and for each of these qualities or properties, there's going to be an opposite, as you'll see. So let's start with this. Let's start with the property of being eternal. versus the property of being mortal. Okay, if something is eternal, the idea of something eternal, of course, is the idea of something that its being lasts forever. Whereas if it's mortal, that would mean that its being comes to an end at some point, it dies, right? So I'm claiming that Eternality is an ontological quality because eternality is something that pertains to the very being of that thing. And mortality is also an ontological quality. It means that that being is going to stop being. And I'm going to make the claim that if we look at two beings, and let's suppose they're equal in every other respect, but one of them is eternal and one of them is mortal, so it would be true, it would be a fact, it would be an objective fact to say that the eternal being has a better kind of being than the mortal being. Why is it better? Better insofar as it pertains to its being. Because the mortal being is going to have a defect in its being because it's going to stop being at some point. That's just what the idea of mortality is, right? Mortality is the death of a being. That means that that being is there, but then it stops being. Its being stops. So an eternal being has a better kind of, it's like a higher grade, if you will, a higher grade of being than a mortal being. And that's just an objective fact. It's not a statement that has anything to do with I might happen to like mortal beings better than eternal beings, but that's irrelevant to this judgment that an eternal being has a better quality of being than a mortal being. Okay, but that's just one property. Let's talk about a couple other properties. Second, let's talk about necessary versus contingent. Okay, a necessary being would be a being that somehow has to exist. There's something about its being that is 
makes it be that it must exist. A contingent being would be a being that it might exist, but there's nothing necessary about its being. Its being is somehow a matter of luck or chance, or in some way it came into being even though it didn't really have to. Okay, so the idea of a necessary being is a being that must be. There's something about its being that makes it be that it must exist. Whereas a contingent being is a being that somehow it's there, but it's kind of lucky or fortunate that it exists. So its being is contingent, whereas the being of a necessary being is absolutely necessary. And so again, the claim here is that a necessary being objectively has a better kind of being than a contingent being. And here's a third quality. These are, you might say, these are related. Many people would say, well, if a being is necessary, it's going to have to be eternal, right? Okay, but we don't need to debate those questions. Here's a third thing. Let's talk about independence versus dependence. These are somewhat closely related. They might be in some way interchangeable, but the idea of an independent being is a being that somehow its being, its whatever it is, is somehow not dependent on something else for its existence. Okay, that's one kind of independence. A kind of independence would be where this thing exists, and it doesn't depend on anything else for its existence. Its being is independent of anything else. A dependent being would presumably be a contingent being also. A dependent being would be a being that it exists, it has being, but its being is dependent on some other entity for its existence. Okay? So, again, claim here is that the first ones here, eternality, necessity, independence, these would make a being better in its being than a being that's mortal, contingent, dependent. These are flaws in a being's being, whereas these are good qualities for a being to have insofar as it is a being. Okay, now we get to a very important step. I'm going to go ahead and claim that we can pair up the following qualities, or contrast the following qualities, autonomous versus inautonomous. I don't know if that's really a word. Um, autonomous versus non-autonomous, perhaps would be more grammatically correct. What is the idea of an autonomous being? An autonomous being is somehow a being that is, in some way, it might, it might not be completely independent of other beings, but an autonomous being is a being that is, in some way, self-controlling. That's literally what the word autonomous means. Autos means self. Nomos in, Greeks, in Greek comes from the word for governance or... Uh, rule. So we talk about like an autonomous region of a country would be a region that is able to in some way enforce its own rules on itself. An autonomous uh, state or an autonomous country is a country that somehow it's able to rule itself and not be ruled by uh, entities or states that are outside of it. Okay, so autonomy is the quality or ability to be in control of one's own being, at least to some degree. Now, actually, I would argue, I'm going to say something a little bit bizarre now, but I'm going to say that a being that is able to commit suicide, and of course, suicide is a bad thing. I don't think suicide is a good thing. But the fact is that if a being is able to commit suicide, that shows that it has control over its own being. The idea of suicide is self-destruction, right? A, a person who commits suicide is someone who takes himself outside of being. He's there, he's existing, 
And then he decides, I'm going to end my being. Now, when you think about it, I, I, know, I do want to argue that suicide is a bad thing. I certainly agree with that. But the fact that the human being is able to commit suicide, we have the potential, we have the ability to commit suicide, right? That shows that we have a great degree of control over our own being. An inautonomous being would be a being that doesn't have control over itself. Its being is somehow, not only its existence, but its nature is ruled by things outside of itself completely. So the argument here is that autonomy is a kind of independence. And since it's a kind of independence, it is also a, an ontological quality that makes one being have a better kind of being than a being that is not autonomous. Now we can have a whole discussion and argument about what creatures are or are not autonomous. I would certainly say that inanimate objects, rocks, stones, those are not autonomous, okay? You have a rock, it is basically not able to do anything. It doesn't even have any ability to do, to act. So an entity that doesn't act is certainly not autonomous. It's there, but it doesn't have any control over what happens to it whatsoever. I would argue that living creatures, and especially the more complex creatures, that is to say the ones that have a greater degree of rationality and thought are more autonomous than creatures that do not have that complexity and do not have rational thought. The highest degree of autonomy, and I'm going to make this my fifth and final ontological quality, is free choice. Free choice versus, I'll just say, lack of free choice. Okay, now, the notion of free choice is one of the most uh, discussed topics in the history of philosophy. What is free choice? Or sometimes it's called free will. Sometimes it's called agency, the ability to make choices. Human beings have free choice. We can argue about what is the true nature of free choice, but if we define free choice as the ability to make decisions, the ability to rationally consider options and to choose between options, that's a very simple definition of free choice. It does seem like human beings have the ability to do that, we have free choice. Free choice is a very high degree of autonomy. If you have free choice, you're able to not only choose to do certain actions rather than others, but the power of free choice that human beings have goes beyond that. The power of free choice that humans have is the ability to, in a way, create ourselves. I don't mean that we create our body, okay? I didn't create my body. My body is sort of given to me, as it were, by birth, right? I didn't bring myself into existence. I didn't choose to come into existence. But if we believe in free choice, as I do, that means that I have the ability to choose not only given actions, but I have the ability to choose what kind of a person am I going to be. I have the ability to create my own character because the character of a person has to do with the way that person comes to act on a regular basis, okay? So a person who has a compassionate character, that might to some degree be due to their environment and their upbringing, but a person who chooses consistently to act in a compassionate way becomes a compassionate person. And that's just one example. So by choosing to live a certain way of life, a person through free choice has the ability 
to create and invent themselves in a way that they choose to be. That is a tremendous kind of power that human beings as a species have. And so therefore, free choice is a very high level of autonomy. It's a kind of independence. We are not metaphysically independent. Okay, what I mean by that is um, all human beings, as far as I know, are in some way dependent on other things for their existence, okay? Um, I don't know if they're, well, for the purposes of this discussion, let's leave out the idea that w whether we have a soul that's eternal or not, let's leave that uh, out of this discussion. I don't think human beings have necessary existence. Um, we are not metaphysically independent, we are dependent, but nevertheless, because we have free choice, we have an ontological quality that makes our being better than beings that lack free choice. We are better beings than beings that do not have free choice. What's better about us? There's something better about the level, the quality of our being, okay? And those are objective facts. They're not matters of, well, I happen to like free being. Actually, I do. I happen to like having free will. It's nice to have free will. I enjoy it in general. Sometimes it's perplexing and it's difficult and it's challenging. Sometimes you wish everything that you did would be sort of automatically mapped out and you didn't have difficult choices to make. So sometimes free choice is actually um, not so pleasant, but the fact that we have free choice makes us better beings than those beings that lack free choice. Now, what we can say in summary so far is that let's talk about the idea of God. And again, nothing here depends on God's existence. Whether there is an eternal being, let's leave that out for now. But if there were an eternal being, if there were a being that is eternal, necessary, independent, autonomous, and had the highest level of free choice possible, then that being would be really, really good as a being. And of course, that's the traditional idea of God. The idea of God in at least traditional, philosophically sophisticated monotheism is the idea of a being who is eternal, necessary, independent, autonomous and free and has the level of freedom that is the best possible level of freedom. And by the way, in order to have freedom, one has to have rationality, one has to be able to consider choices, one also has to have some kind of executive power to implement one's choices. So I would say that a being that lacks reason or lacks the executive power to implement its choices is not going to be the best being. But here's where I differ a little bit from what I understand Kant to hold. Kant held that rationality is what makes us have intrinsic worth. And I'm arguing, and maybe you could see a little bit of this in Kant too, is that it's not rationality that makes us so special, it's our free choice, it's our agency. In order to have agency, we need to have reason. In any event, God, if he exists, would be the best possible being, the being that has all the doodads, all the good ontological qualities in the highest possible way. But whether God exists or not, it's still the case that autonomy and free choice are good ontological qualities to have. And so a being that has free choice is going to be objectively a better being than a being that lacks free choice. Now, before we get to the connection of this with morality, what I've tried to show, again, is that a being that has these qualities would be intrinsically better than a being that lacks it. But what's the connection between all this and morality? So before we get to morality, let's talk about two very important notions, which are going to be important for the theory. And these notions are well-being the notion of well-being and the notion of being well. OK, 
okay? Um, the idea of well-being is if you have a being, then well-being would mean something like health. A, a being has well-being if it is functioning in the way that that being is supposed to function given that it is the being that it is, okay? So for example, obviously if I am ill, if I am sick, if one of my organs is not working the way it's supposed to be, then I am not well. I have a deficiency in my well-being. Now, well-being is kind of one way to think about well-being here would be that um, anything that is going to inhibit my behavior in such a way that it makes my death or lack of being come closer is going to be a sign that I am not well. Okay? Now, of course, there's, um, there's diseases and illnesses that people can have for their whole life, and they basically are able to function, but they're still not well. Um, being well, on the other hand, I use the term being well to connote something like what Aristotle had in mind when he talked about the telos of the human being or flourishing. Flourishing, reaching one's potential or actualizing one's potential. But we have to put a little bit of a limit on this. Flourishing, what does that mean, reaching one's potential? I mean, I have the potential, you could say, to, let's say, be a bank robber. Um, would that be a case of being well? Is a human engaged in being well? Or what I'm thinking here in terms of being well is like living well. Okay, to live well is to be the being that you are, but go beyond that, to reach your potential, uh, given that you are the kind of being that you are. So a, a bank robber would be doing something that would be violating someone else's well-being, presumably. So in any case, well-being has to do with the health of a given thing, being well has to do with flourishing, reaching one's potential, but doing it in such a way that one does not engage in doing something wrong. Now, let me backtrack a little bit and give you an, uh, an example. Let's go back to my example of the cockroach. We've already said that a human being, because we have free will, because we have free choice, because we have that very high level of autonomy, a human being is a better being than a cockroach. A cockroach is a creature that lacks free will. Everything that a cockroach does is not a result of any kind of deliberation or choice, at least not at the level that a human being is capable of doing so. So therefore, Killing a cockroach just for fun, I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but it's definitely not as bad as killing a human being just for fun. Why is killing a human being just for fun so bad? Well, here's this being that has the status as being, and therefore to exterminate that being is to destroy something that has a level of being that's relatively high. And so therefore, stomping on the cockroach, well, that is also killing something that has some degree of being. It's not as bad because you're exterminating or stopping the existence of something that is a lesser being than a being such as a human. Okay, so we're going to get into more elaborate uh, detail about what living a moral life involves. It involves more than just not killing humans. Um, instead of cockroaches, but um, these notions, let's go back to well-being is, the well-being of a thing is the proper functioning of that thing insofar as it is what it is. Um, the flourishing of a being would be the realization of those potentials in that human being, if we're talking about a human, reaching one's potential, but only in such a way 
that one is not doing anything which is a violation of anything else's well-being, okay? Now, um, we can now move on to um, talk about the two main aspects of the moral life, according to this theory, and the two major attitudes, and we'll see that there's different dimensions to these attitudes, the two main attitudes of the moral life, living the moral life, have, has to do with what we're going to call respect and love. Okay, some moral theories prefer to talk about specific actions and try to come up with a rule like utilitarianism tries to come up with a rule that would determine whether given actions are going to be considered right or wrong. On this theory, um, where we say that um, certain beings have intrinsic worth, well, all beings in some way have intrinsic worth on this theory. God, if he exists, would have the highest level of intrinsic worth. Um, inanimate objects, almost none or very little intrinsic worth. And then human beings have this special intrinsic worth because of free choice. Um, so respect has to do with having a certain attitude toward those beings that have intrinsic worth. And also love is going to have to do with having a certain attitude. It's a certain, you might say, a character trait or a way of dealing with those creatures that have intrinsic worth. Both respect and love have a cognitive an emotional and a practical dimension um, for both love and respect. Okay, so um, let's talk about respect first. Now, the cognitive aspect of respect is, it has to do with something you do with your mind. Recognizing that something or being has the level of intrinsic worth that it has insofar as it is the being that it is. That's the cognitive aspect. I consider a human being and I say, hmm, this human being, it's dependent metaphysically, but it's an autonomous creature, it has free choice. Wow, I recognize that being has intrinsic worth. I also have to recognize it, by the way, about myself. So self-respect is something we ought to have. I have a certain intrinsic worth as a, as a being, and recognizing that I have that degree of worth and that other humans around me have that same degree of worth is part of having respect. Now, there's also an emotional dimension to respect. Emotional dimension means feeling that sort of, let's call it a kind of reverence, a person. This is a human being. This isn't a cockroach. This isn't just something like a tree or a stone or a rock. This entity has intrinsic worth of a very high level. And feeling that, having that emotion of reverence is part of the idea of respect. And then the practical dimension of respect would be not to do anything which would violate the well-being of that thing insofar as it is the kind of being that it is. Okay? So respect involves what I would say is all the don'ts, so to speak, of ordinary morality. The basic one, the most obvious one, would be do not murder. Do not murder. This is a creature that has a special level of being. Now, there may be cases where indeed you 
do need to kill someone, unfortunately, because let's suppose that person is about to kill someone else who is innocent. There may be cases where we need to do that, but all things being equal, murder is wrong. Especially another thing that would be a lack of respect is to violate someone else's autonomy. That's one of the worst ways in which we can disrespect someone, is to not recognize that here's a creature that has free choice, and that free choice is a very special power. So to enslave someone or to make someone else into something that they don't want to be or are not choosing to be freely, those would be an abuse, a lack of respect. So to murder, to kidnap, to rape, to enslave, those would be examples of don'ts. They would be a failure of respect. Love, on the other hand, has to do with something more positive, okay? So all the moral rules that we're familiar with kind of break up into do's and don'ts. Don't murder, don't steal, don't cheat, don't abuse someone, don't try to manipulate someone into doing something that they don't choose freely to do in general. Love has to do with the do's. Again, it has a cognitive dimension, recognizing intellectually, this is something you do with your mind, recognizing that a given creature, whether it's a human or a dog, let's focus on humans, uh, recognizing that a given human, any human, has free choice and has a level of being that is special and worthy of respect, but also recognizing that this entity has potentials to realize as the kind of being that it is. Emotional aspect of love is having the feeling, having the passion and compassion and the level of care for a person so that one can be led to the practical behavior of nurturing and fostering the growth and flourishing of another person. So love involves nurturing, caring, helping someone to realize their best potential. That's what, for example, a good parent is supposed to do among other things, take care of the child, but also help the child realize its best potential. So to love someone, of course there's many different kinds of love. There's erotic love, there's sensual love, romantic love. I'm not trying to say that this is the only way to think about love. I'm using the term love here to capture a certain character trait that is very important for living a moral life. And what I'm saying, in fact, is that it's rational to have a certain kind of love for, in a way, all creatures, but especially for humans and especially for those who are around us, for those that we have the opportunity and the ability to nurture and care for. Okay, there are many, many humans across the world and just practically speaking, I can't nurture and care for, you know, human beings that are on the other side of the globe or even on the other side of uh, the street. But what I can do is, especially I'm in a position as a parent, if I have that position, or if I'm a friend, if I'm in the position of being a friend to someone, I can recognize, hey, here's this special person. Here's these qualities that they have. Here's these potentials that they have to realize, to flourish as the being that they are. So to love someone in the practical way is to do those things that will help them foster, grow, and realize their uh, potentials. Now, um, there's something very special that needs to be said about um, the unique quality that free choice gives us, which I um, could have said earlier, but I'll say it now. And that is that because we have, well, let's consider this question. 
I've claimed that, in a way, all things, frogs, dogs, dolphins, all creatures have some kind of intrinsic worth insofar as they are the beings that they are. And the more autonomous they are, the more free choice they have, the better they are. Okay. Now, if something has free choice, let's start again. If something has intrinsic worth, but it doesn't have free choice, okay? If something has some degree of autonomy, I would say that even a plant has a certain, let's say you have a tree in your backyard. The tree has its own autonomous nature to it. But let's say it lacks free choice. Okay, if something has intrinsic worth, does that entail or imply that it has a right to life? Does that entail or imply that it is somehow worthy of existing? I would argue, no. Even though a thing has intrinsic worth, that doesn't necessarily entail that it has a right to exist, that somehow it deserves to exist, okay? Now, many philosophers have discussed uh, the idea of a right to life, the whole idea of rights, natural rights. Do we have rights? Where would rights come from? So, I would like to argue that, we'll have to leave this up on the board for now, but the question here we're dealing with is, what is the relationship between intrinsic worth and a right to life, or somehow, by the term, a right to life, we might understand that to mean that somehow I am entitled to exist, that somehow I deserve to exist, okay? Well, here's one way of thinking about it. I would claim that if a creature has free choice, it can choose to do actions that are morally worthy of being done. So for example, I have free choice, and let's suppose I see a human being drowning in the river. I have the choice, let's suppose I have the power and the ability to jump into the river and save that person. Well, if I don't do it, I would be doing something objectively wrong because I'm permitting something that has the status of that being that's pretty high level to just go down. If I jump into the river and I save that person, I have done something that is right to do. I, I saved from death a being that has a certain special status as a being. Okay, now, because creatures that have free choice have the ability to do morally worthy actions, that means that not only do we have the ability to create our character for good or for bad, but we have the ability to engage in morally good actions, and therefore our lives become morally worthy of being lived. A person who does good actions on a regular basis and avoids bad actions on a regular basis is a person who is living a morally praiseworthy life. And therefore, their life is morally worthy of being lived. And so therefore, we now have an extra reason to respect specifically, particularly human lives. Those creatures, such as humans, that are able to engage in morally worthy behavior in some way are able to acquire and earn a right to life. They deserve to live because they are creatures that are capable of doing things that are morally worthy of being done, objectively speaking. Okay? Now, of course, an infant is someone who's never had yet the chance to do morally worthy actions. Theory here is saying that human beings as a species, though, have the ability 
to do moral actions, and therefore intrinsically, all humans have this special level of worth. Okay, so even an infant deserves to be saved because of its potential for living a morally worthy life. It deserves to be respected because it, it's a being that has potential for free choice. I would say that infants lack free choice. We, we can also talk about cases uh, such as you know elderly people, very elderly or sick people, not necessarily elderly, but people who are sick, people in a coma. People can lose their individual capacity for free choice. The argument here is that human beings as a species have free choice. Human beings as a species have the ability to engage in morally worthy action, and therefore, human beings are especially worthy of respect and also worthy of love because we have intrinsic worth and because we have the ability to live lives that are morally worthy of being lived, which gives us, in a sense, a right to life. So, um, a few things now just to sort of wrap this up. Um, regarding non-human animals, we could have a discussion about what, um, what would respect and love look like for non-human animals. I think that, um, I would argue that because human beings are better, higher beings than most other creatures that we're aware of, that gives us the moral right, the moral authority to utilize those lesser creatures for our purposes, as long as those purposes are, purposes are legitimate, they serve our well-being and they allow us to flourish. However, abuse of the natural world um, would be, uh, or sort of um, random acts of um, slaughter or just going into a forest and burning it down would be, I think, a violation, a moral violation of the intrinsic worth of those entities that have a certain level of intrinsic worth. But I believe that human beings have the moral authority to use lesser creatures to live and to live well, but only with the proper respect that those entities or creatures are due. Now going back to God for a minute, if God exists, it would turn out that um, there is a being who has this supreme or ultimate intrinsic worth. I would say that God would be worthy of the utmost respect and the utmost kind of love. And if this were a philosophy of religion class, we would then talk about, well, what does respect for God mean? What does love for God mean? It's not going to mean the same thing as it is for humans because God doesn't really seem to need our nurturing and caring. Yet, on the other hand, if God has projects, if God has commandments, if that's true, then fulfilling God's commands would be a part of respect and bringing about God's plan or project for humanity for the world would be an example of what would be included in love for God. But that really was not the main um, thrust or point of this, this lecture. Whether God exists or not, humans do exist, and we do have free choice. We are beings that are capable of living morally worthy lives, so therefore we're due uh, a very special level of respect and love. Now finally, I'd like to say a couple things about what is sometimes called the motivational question. The motivational question is, why should a person behave morally? What's the motive for behaving morally? Now, sometimes people behave morally. Now, in this theory, behaving morally would have to do with having respect and love for your fellow creatures. Why should a person do that? What's the motivation for behaving morally? Well, on this theory, the answer is a very simple and straightforward answer. The answer is, one should behave morally because it's the right thing to do, period. There is not necessarily a connection between living a respectful and loving life and living a life that is enjoyable or gives you gratification or pleasure. 
there's not a necessary connection between doing what is right and gaining some kind of pleasure or let's call it happiness. Why should you do something that's right? Because it's objectively right to do. That's the answer. I believe that human beings can be motivated um, by a recognition, by a cognitive understanding and appreciation for this, here's this being that is of a very special, intrinsically worthy nature, and therefore the proper thing to do is to, let's say, save that person from death or not violate that person's autonomy. That's the right thing to do, and that in and of itself can and should be the motive for behaving morally. However, there's another side to this, which is that I also think that when we ask the question, what is happiness? What is human happiness? Happiness has to do with fulfilling oneself as a human, okay? Kind of going back to that Aristotelian idea of the telos, realizing one's potential insofar as one is the kind of being that one is. What is the best potential to live? It's to live a moral life. The best potential that we have from a moral point of view, from a point of view of objectively what's good, is to live a respectful life and a loving life. And that is, in effect, to lead a meaningful life. We haven't talked about the notion of a meaningful life, but I would say that one way of looking at a meaningful life is, well, if you want to live a meaningful life, you want to live a life that's objectively the best one. And that's what living a moral life is. So it turns out, here's what I would claim, that overall, in most cases, a person who lives a moral life, a life of respect and a life of love, is going to be a person who realizes one's potential and therefore lives a happy life. That's what living a happy life is. Overall, that's what should most of the times happen. However, in some cases, doing the moral thing, doing the right thing, showing respect for a certain person, or showing love for a certain individual may require giving up something that is going to make you not so happy. It certainly may involve pain. Pain on this theory really doesn't have, in and of itself, pain is not bad, it's not good either. Pleasure is, it feels good, but what would make pain objectively bad is um, the fact that being in pain does not allow you to realize your potential. Or if you have pain, you can then become dysfunctional, right? If you have pain in some of your limbs, you're not able to function as a human being normally functions, that would mean you don't have well-being. So that would make pain bad. Um, but in general, going back to the question of motivation, going back to the question of happiness, living a moral life overall would coincide with living a happy life. Sometimes it doesn't. You still have the motivation for behaving morally because that is objectively the right thing to do and we have the ability to do good things and act rightly just because it is the right thing to do. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.